The Ukrainian army is saying now that it's preparing to take Lugansk and Donetsk in the east street by street, building by building. The two cities are regional capitals and centers of anti-government resistance, and for that they've been paying a very heavy price. At least four people were killed in just the latest attack on Lugansk. Now, the army's shelling has left much of the city destroyed. In fact, the locals in Lugansk are plotting a map in areas struck just to show you exactly how bad the damage is. Look at that. As you can see here, it's been more or less obliterated, this large city with a population of a million. About a half, half a million of them who used to live there have now left and tried to flee the violence. RT's Maria Fenoshna reports from the Russia-Ukraine border where thousands are attempting to escape. It's the final countdown for Lugansk and Donetsk, Kiev warns. For now, eastern Ukraine remains under the control of anti-government forces. But shelling in the region is intensifying. We tried to cross the border to cover wherever is to come. The Netsk checkpoint at the Russian-Ukrainian border. The line of cars and people stretches for kilometers and almost nobody is willing to cross into Ukraine. Once you are through, you are in the anti-terror operation zone where no one can guarantee your safety. For hours, we searched for a driver to take us towards Lugansk with little success. Then we met Anatoly. He's 63 years old and is from Lugansk. Almost every day he travels to Russia and then back to Ukraine with a mission. When people escaped from the attacks, they took very little with them. That's why many of the refugees don't even have documents when they arrive in a new place. So I bring them what they need. Recently, people have started to ask him to bring their winter clothes. They've lost hope of a quick end to the crisis. Anatoly says sometimes he arrives too late, and the house he has been sent to has either been looted or lies in ruins. We ask him to take us alone on one of his salvage trips, but he says he hasn't been able to get across the border for two days himself. You don't know if you'll be shot at or not when you're driving through Lugansk. There is an area the army uses to attack the city. They're surrounded, but they keep attacking the city. So instead, we try to get to Donetsk. We ask an anti-government fighter what lies ahead. Alexander tells us his small town, which lies between the city and the border, has seen some of the most intense shelling in the area. He's driving back there, and he admits there are huge risks. I think they don't want to let the refugees cross the Russian border, which is why they are shooting at the roads. They're also trying to cut us off from humanitarian aid, food and water. Alexander politely refuses to take us with him. We take his number and agree to keep in touch to check on him and the road once he reaches his destination. We've rung several times, but no one is answering. Marif Noshnati on the Russian-Ukrainian border. And playing an active role in Kiev's crackdown on the east is the National Guard, a privately funded special group that largely consists of ultra-nationalists. This video here shows one of the units going on a witch hunt for what they call a separatists. You can see soldiers storming the house. They uh, detain that man, beat him up, put a bag over his head and throw him in the back of a car. Now, the National Guard is believed to be behind the disappearance of uh, RIA Novosti photojournalist Andrei Stenin. He went missing in eastern Ukraine four days ago. He's reportedly being held captive. Uh, the agency has demanded Stenin be released. A hashtag free Andrew has been set up on Twitter to help his plight. Now, just two weeks ago, a British correspondent who's occasionally working for RT was also detained. He says he was beaten and tortured for three days before being deported.